Hey, we're so glad that you're worshiping with us, and I'm just excited what God is doing in and through our church as we study the book of Galatians. I was at lunch this past week, and I had a conversation with a friend, and I've known this guy for oh, over five, almost six years from now, and he's kind of had these cycles of ups and downs, and he wanted to get together, and he's like, hey, I just need to have a conversation. And I was like, okay, here we go again. Like, what's he going to complain about this time, or what's he dealing with, or what pattern of behavior is he still struggling with? And so I, we sat down, and I said, okay, Lord, just have your presence here. Just make it so evident. I pray that your spirit speaks to us so loudly. Got our food, and he said, you know what? I just want to tell you something. I said, oh, yeah, what's that? He goes, man, I finally figured it out. I said, what's that you figured out? He goes, you know, the reality is if you look at really my whole life, it has been this vicious cycle of feeling great and feeling frustrated. Feeling like I had joy and then moments of hopelessness. He said, I, I spent most of my life enslaved by what people think of me. How they would define me. He goes, I spent a lot of my life enslaved in pursuing sports or finding my worth and how accomplished I am. He goes, a lot of my married life, I've been enslaved to the emotions of my wife, meaning if I did something wrong, I felt like I let her down and I was a failure. And the reason we had marriage tension is because of everything I said, did, or didn't do. He goes, I've been enslaved to trying to make as much money as possible, and that will give me worth. That will give me hope. And then he goes, you know what? I mean, I've been enslaved, trying to be my best, working my hardest, doing everything I can in my own power to make something of myself. But I was never enough. I feel like I was a failure, that I never did it right. He goes, but you know what? I figured it out. That's not freedom. I can't have freedom. I can't find freedom in the things of this world. I can't find true freedom by how hard I work. That's where we're in today. We're going to look at what are the things maybe we're enslaved to. We're going to look at the idea of slaves versus sons. So I want to pray for us, and before we do that, though, I just want you to ask God in this moment, do you feel like my friend, always trying through your works, through your power, through what you're good at, through what you make, what you accomplish, what your kids accomplish, where you live, what you wear, what you drive, where your office is located, where you get to travel, how spiritual you are, how religious you are, and ask yourself, is that where I'm trying to find my freedom? Let's pray and let's see what the Apostle Paul has in the book of Galatians. God, we, we love you. Lord, I'm so thankful for the study in Galatians. I'm thankful for what you're doing. Lord, how you've used it in my soul to continually remind me where true freedom comes from. God, I pray that any of those listening to this message, wherever they are in the world, God, that you will meet them there. And if they've never experienced this before, they'll experience salvation that comes from you. And they'll find true freedom. In the name we pray. Amen. So as I said, we're in the book of Galatians. We're in our sixth week here in the study. And it's been awesome as we look at freedom and where that comes from and what God is doing. Now to remind you, the book of Galatians is in the New Testament written by the Apostle Paul. See, the region of Galatia is in modern-day Turkey. So God was working. People were coming to know Jesus, both Jew and Gentile. And more and more people were coming to faith. So Jewish leaders got wind of this, even some of the disciples, and they go there, and they are reminding people, no, it, it's Jesus, but it's Jesus plus the law. What do I mean by law? The, the set of rules and regulations that God gives us in the Old Testament that we're called to live by. And we'll get to more to that later. But these Jewish leaders say, no, no, it's Jesus plus specifically circumcision. 
If you call yourself a believer, you need Jesus plus this, Jesus plus that, Jesus plus your works. And so Paul writes this letter. He is frustrated at them. He says, you foolish Galatians, this letter to the region of Galatia is reminding them that it's Jesus plus nothing else. Freedom comes from Christ and Christ alone. So we're going to end in, uh, sorry, we're going to begin this message in Galatians chapter 3, the end of chapter 3, and then we'll go on to chapter 4. So our first point today is this, is that Jesus unifies us as his children. I'll say that again. Jesus unifies us as his children. So let's look at this here. In Galatians 3.26, it says, For you are all sons of God. For you are all sons of God. He's saying, if you're a believer, if you believe Jesus is Lord, if you believe in the gospel of Jesus Christ, what is the gospel? It's the good news of Jesus, that he came, lived this perfect, sinless life. He died on this tree, and on the third day, he conquered sin and death. And you believe in his life, death, and resurrection. That is the gospel. He's saying, if you believe this, for you are all sons of God, not just Abraham, but God. We saw earlier, last week in chapter 3, that we're all through the seed of Abraham. That seed, singular, is Jesus Christ. We're all sons of Abraham, but specifically what we're saying here, you're son of God. It goes on to say, through faith. He's reminding them it's through their faith in Christ Jesus, not their works. Paul's saying, hey, it's Jesus and Jesus only. It goes on in verse 27. For as many of you were baptized into Christ, have put on Christ. Now, let me say that again. It says, for as many of you were baptized. He's saying not water baptism here. This is more metaphorically speaking. He's saying, for as many of you were baptized into Christ, meaning this, that you believe, once you believe that Jesus is Lord, all right, you he comes into your life through the regeneration of your heart. You've been justified by the work on the cross. At this moment, you are putting to death your old self. And then you are clothed in Christ with his resurrection. And you've been clothed with his righteousness. For example, baptism. We celebrate that. We'll have coming up uh, sometime this summer, Raised to Life Weekend. When we celebrate baptism, that is someone, it's the literal sense of getting into the water they go under the water and come up. What that is a picture of is that you are putting your old self, Jesus' blood washes you, you go under the water, and you come out, you're resurrected out of this water, you are raised to life with Christ. So what Paul is saying, for as many of you were baptized into Christ, you have put on Christ, that you have access to God, you have his Holy Spirit, you are made new, and you are declared righteous. Goes on. In verse 3, sorry, chapter 3, verse 28, Paul says there's neither Jew nor Greek. And this is important to understand. Because what the Jewish people were trying to say, these leaders were saying, you need to live like a Jew. You need the law. You need to be circumcised. You need to celebrate and live all the festivals that we do. And he goes, no, there's neither Jew nor Greek, neither slave nor free. There's neither male nor female for you are all one in Christ Jesus. This goes to our point that Jesus unifies us as his children. I mean, yes, there are people that are Hispanic. My mom's from Cuba. She's Cuban. Okay, there are people from Spain. There's people from Africa. There's people from Asia, Japan, Russia, Australia. There are different nationalities, yes, we could look different, maybe have different colors of skin. What Jesus is, or what Apostle Paul is saying, that when we believe in Jesus, we become one in Christ Jesus. Let's, let's pause on this for a moment. What is this idea of unity? See, I think what the Jewish leaders are saying, no, if we're one, it's uniformity. And I think what Paul's saying is not uniformity. What I mean by that is everything has to be the same. We all have to say the exact same words, live the exact same, live in the same place, do the exact same traditions all together. He's saying, no, 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 that's uniformity. He says, we are all one through the idea of unity. And there's great 
there is great hope in the fact that we are all one through Christ Jesus. So think about maybe just Grace Church, whether the online campus or our physical locations in Aletha, South Overland Park, and North Overland Park. There's a lot of different walks of life. But think about this. We are all one, whether you're a Republican or a Democrat. No, we're one through Christ Jesus. That's more important. Whether you're white or black or Asian or Hispanic, no, we are one through Christ Jesus. Whether you have the gift of prophecy, whether you have the gift of teaching, the gift of administration, guess what? We are one in Christ Jesus. And the amazing thing is here, as Christ unifies us, when we as a church understand that we're all one, he died for us all, he loves us, he sees us as righteous, when we unite as the bride of Christ, we are a force that changes the world. Think about this. Over 2,000 years ago, Jesus died. He set up his church, and as God began to move and the gospel began to spread in the midst of persecution in the midst of loss, in the midst of death, in the midst of confusion, even false teaching, Jesus continued to bring everyone back through his spirit and says, no, we are one through Christ Jesus. And Apostle Paul is reminding them that no matter what your background is, no matter where you come, even your customs, once you give your life to Jesus, we are the unified body of Christ. It goes on in verse 29. He goes, and if you are Christ, oh, this is so powerful, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Let me read that again. It says, and if you are Christ, meaning if you are a Christian, you're a believer through the covenant of faith, not your works, not what you think you can achieve by your religiosity. No, no, no. Through Christ and Christ alone, the promise, the covenant of faith, if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Okay, heirs. If you're an heir, that means you inherit something. I talked about this a little bit last week to the, the North Overland Park campus. My parents have a trust. And when they pass away, my mom and my dad, when that time comes, they have a trust. And we will inherit, whether it's their house or things they have or uh, antiques or whatever money is in their investments, we will inherit it because I am their son. My sisters are their daughters. Well, we get inherit. Since we're a son of God, if you give your life to Christ, you're a son or a daughter of God. You are an heir. You inherit the promises of God. So, what is it we're inheriting? Think about this for a moment. What is the promise? If we are this unified body of Christ and you've given your life to Jesus, you have the promise of salvation. What is salvation? It's being saved. What are you saved from? Your sin. You're saved from eternal damnation and hell, separated from God forever. When you are a Jesus follower, you inherit the promise that you are saved from your sin, not by what you did, but what he did. Not only that, the promise that we do not have to live in fear. I mean, these people who are works-based said, oh, you know, people say this all the time. Hey, guess what? I'm a good person. Well, how do you know you're good enough? But when we know Jesus Christ is Lord, he makes us new. And we don't have to live in fear like, oh, if I make a mistake, oh, that's it. I can't go back. There's nothing else I can do. No, 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 no. It is Christ alone and his promise that we don't have to live in fear. I mean, we have a promise that we can rest in Jesus. Think about that. Think about the conversation with my friend this past week, how hard he's tried and how exhausted he felt. And he said, you know what? It's not about what I do. It's about what he did. The problem is those who are religious are not rested. But when we go to him, it is incredible promise. I mean, Jesus says himself, come to me. All you who are weary, all you who are tired, all you who are heavy laden, anxious, overwhelmed, worn out. He goes, I will give you rest. It's not your works. That's not going to make you rest. It's not how good you are. That's not going to make you rested. It's not how much money you give. That's not going to want to, that's not going to make you rested. It's what Christ is. So if we're an heir, what are we inheriting? We're inheriting the promise of rest. Think about this. 
If you inherit the promise of God, you don't have to carry the weight of sin, condemnation anymore. Things you've said, people you've hurt, mistakes you've made, you have a promise that that is as far as the east is from the west. And lastly, I mean, there are other things we inherit, but lastly, I'm going to mention today is we, pro- we have the promise of an eternal home, an eternal resting place with God the Father, eternal home in heaven forever and ever and ever. And Revelation 4 gives a beautiful picture of it. And at that moment, we can say, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. When we are the unified body of Christ, when we give our life to him, through faith in what Jesus did on the cross and the power of his resurrection, we are sons of God, we are daughters of God, and we inherit his promise. Now let's go to Galatians chapter 4. We're going to begin in verse 1. Before we do that, our next point, and our last point is this, is that Jesus frees us from slavery. Think about it. I was talking to my friend. He said, I feel enslaved to work or trying to make money or to the emotions of my wife. Not that her emotions are bad, but I always felt like it was my job to make her feel whole and I could never make a mistake. He felt he was enslaved to what people thought about him and how religious, or if he went to church or didn't go to church, he'd feel bad. Or if he didn't miss his Bible reading, he's like, okay, I'm not doing good enough right now. He was enslaved. So we're going to look at how Jesus frees us from slavery because, right, we're, we're writing to a lot of this Jewish audience as well who would have been familiar with the Hebrew history. So if we think about that for a moment, the Jewish people were enslaved, let's just say for a moment, to the Egyptians, all right? The Israelites were slaves. And so we're going to see kind of this picture back and forth, like, this idea of slavery. We're not talking about like James chapter 1 says James, a bondservant of Christ. Or Apostle Paul often talking about we're a slave to Christ out of our love for him. We're not, we're not talking about that. We're talking, to, when he uses the word slaves, he's reverting back to when they were slaves in captivity. So it goes to verse 1. It says, Now I say that the heir, as long as he is a child, does not differ at all from a slave, though he is a master of all. Well, even in the, think about this, that might be confusing to you for a moment, but even in the Roman Empire, at this time, children of wealthy people were cared for by slaves. See, the master commanded the slave who commanded the child. So he says, now I say that the heir, as long as he is a child, does not differ from a slave. Goes on in verse 2. But is under guardians and stewards until the time appointed by the father. The time appointed means the time of Jesus. That Jesus was the time the Father had appointed. So Paul here is reminding them, his audience, the people in the region of Galatia, that the law was the guardian. The law, let's say the Ten Commandments in Exodus chapter 20, it was their guardian to help reveal their really their utter sinfulness and their need for Jesus. Just like the law that we have in the United States, for example. Okay, we have law that helps us, uh, restrains evil. It helps it not be chaos everywhere. And so what Paul is saying, hey, the, the law, it was a guardian that helped you navigate life, helped discipline you, and also showed ultimately that we need Jesus. It goes on, even so, when we were children, we were in bondage under the elements of the world. So there's a lot here. So let let me try to simplify this as much as possible. Paul is saying, hey, if you are saying it's through your works, it's through being legalistic, it's a step, it's not a step towards spiritual growth. This is actually a step towards immaturity. He's saying if, if, if you say it's Jesus plus being baptized, that's salvation. If you're saying Jesus plus theology, Jesus plus religiosity, Jesus plus a checklist, Jesus plus circumcision, Jesus plus the law, he's saying, you know what? You think that's spiritual growth, but no. What you're doing is you're becoming a, like a child again. And you're going to feel enslaved by fear, exhaustion, and hopelessness. 
If you think it's Jesus plus anything else, you're going to be enslaved to your works. But in verse 4, he goes on to say, But when the fullness of time, what is this fullness of time? Again, it's Jesus' birth, life, his death, and resurrection. When the Messiah came to redeem the world. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem, verse 5, who were under the law. Did you know that the word, Paul uses this in the New Testament, the original Greek meaning for the word redeemed here is to buy the slave from a market and set them free. The literal translation is to buy a slave from the slave market and then set them free. He says, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem who were under the law, to set you free from the law. What Jesus did, he came through his death and his resurrection. He said, I have freed you from the law. I have freed you from having to be perfect. I have freed you from having to try your best with all your works and with all your power. He says, I have freed you from that. Jesus redeemed the world who are under the law that we might receive the adoption as sons. See, those who put their faith believe that Jesus, through faith alone, that's where life comes from. Here you go, verse 6. And because you are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying out, Abba, Father. What is the word Abba means? Daddy, Daddy. He says, don't, don't, I'm going to say that again. And because you are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts. What do you say? When you believe Jesus Christ is Lord, when you give your heart to him, at that moment, the Holy Spirit is in your life. And I say we say this, or I know we say this in church a lot. When you believe Jesus as Savior, the same Jesus that raised same God, sorry, that raised Jesus from the dead, that same power of the resurrection power is the same power that lives in you. 2 Peter 1.4 says, when we, when we trust in Christ, we're partakers of the divine nature. You've been adopted into God's family. The Spirit lives in you. The Spirit empowers you. The Spirit convicts you. The Spirit comforts you. The Spirit guides you. His Spirit leads you. In our last verse today, he says this. Therefore, you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. So I, I thought it'd be interesting on my Facebook this week, I put out there, I said, okay, a little sermon help. And I found very quickly, I already knew this, but people are, love to give their opinions and thoughts and views. And so it was fun. I said, okay, what is your idea? What are your thoughts on hearing slave versus son? And slave in this context is not like James chapter one, hey, a bond servant of Christ. What I'm saying this is them being in captivity by the Egyptians before they escaped and after 40 years found the promised land. I'm, I'm thinking of, when I think of slave as someone who, is, who has been bought, someone who is, has a master that has no say. So I said, what do you think of for slave or son? So I got tons, I mean tons, dozens and dozens and dozens of responses. I began to meditate on those and look at scripture. These are some differences of a slave versus a son. Sorry, a slave versus son. A slave works and toils his entire life with no reward. But a son receives an inheritance because his relationship with the father. A slave your worth is in what you do and what you people think about you and what you bring to them. A son is worth is because what Christ says about you. See, a slave is owned. A son is an, an heir. They are an owner. They inherit the promises of God. See, a slave is used and abused. A son is loved 
and adored. I mean, think about it. Slaves have no relationship with their owner, but sons have a relationship with their father. Slaves' value is based on how hard they work. Sons' value centers on what God says about you, that you're loved, you're redeemed, you're chosen, and you're righteous. See, a slave is not free, but a son is free. What Paul, I believe, wants the people in Galatians to know, what I believe God wants us to know through this letter is this, is that we are, as believers, we are no longer slaves. We are sons and daughters of the king. But so often, we want to go back to our slave owners. I mean, think about this. I mean, even the children of Israel. I mean, Jesus delivered them from this torment and this abuse through the plagues. He parted the Red Sea and he led them to freedom. But then things began to go not how they wanted. They're like, hey, we want to go back. We'd rather be slaves again. And we see that all the time. I mean, think about it. Even in the terrible, terrible part of our history as a country, as we see slaves. See, and so think about this. If you were a slave and someone sets you free from the abuse and the horrid, horrid abuse and work and conditions they had to live in, and someone set them free and they could leave, they could have their own own land and their own food and their own house and they could experience the goodness and fullness of life and joy and hope and they're like no 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 I, I don't want that I, I want to go back to being abused I want to go back to having no say in things I want to go back to being in captivity we wouldn't want to do that the moment we think it's about our works, what we're saying is we want to be enslaved to the things of this world. Are you a slave or are you a son? I want to give you an opportunity right now, if you feel like my friend, that you were enslaved to your job, to your work, to your relationships, never feeling enough, there's only one thing, one person, one God that can set you free, and that is Jesus the Messiah. This whole book right here, this whole letter is saying it's not about who you are, about what your strengths are, what you could provide, it's what Jesus did for you. Our prayer is that you will not be a slave, but you'll be a son of God. I want to encourage you, no matter where you are, man, woman, senior adult, young adult, teenager, kid, or young family, I pray right now that you will make Jesus Lord of your life, because he is the one that sets you free. Bow your head with me. God, we love you. We thank you for this time. We thank you for your word, Lord, so often that I, I can be enslaved to what I can do in my own strength and my own power. And oftentimes, even through the series, you're reminding me it's not about my righteousness, it's about your righteousness. So often I feel like a failure, but you remind me that you love me and your promises that I don't have to live in fear and that you see me as righteous. God, I pray right now, if there's people that don't know you, as they listen to this, you begin to work in their hearts, you'll draw them to yourself. And you'll say, and they'll say, Jesus, be my Lord. So if that's you right now, just pray this with me. Say, dear Jesus, I've been enslaved to the world. I've been enslaved to sin. I've been defined by my mistakes, my mistakes, my shortcomings. And I've been working as hard as I can to be a good person, but I'm exhausted. 
and I realize that I need you, Jesus, to be the Lord of my life. I believe in your death and your resurrection. I believe that you are king. I pray that you will be the center of my life, be my everything. In your name we pray. Amen. Well, that was such a great message from Chris. Really appreciate that. Listen, if you're watching today and you don't have a relationship with Jesus and you'd like more information about that, we would love to help you out. Just go to visitgracechurch.com slash next step. Scroll down to where it says follow Jesus. Just give us a little information and we'll reach out to you this week. Until we meet again next time, just remember that God loves you. We love you. Let's live out with focus this week. Inside, making promises, we both know our lies, but there's no need for pride when surrender wins the fight. With victory in my bones, I'll be singing till morning comes. My heart can find its courage, cause I know even when the night comes, I'm not scared. Cause even when the night comes, I know you'll be there. Cause even when the night comes, my heart